Welcome to the Love, Listen, Talk, Repeat podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Capewell. The topic of each episode is about relationships, the one with ourselves or the relationship with others. So let's get on with this week's episode. I have with me today this lovely man who I've talked to quite a lot of times now. He's the scary guy. And I'm going to just hand you over to Scary to introduce himself and tell us a bit more about himself. Well, it is difficult to introduce me because how do you introduce a guy by the name of the scary guy? That, that's kind of ridiculous in a way when you think about it. <laughs> hey, let me talk about this guy. His name is Scary. And, uh, well, first of all, it's nice to see you again, Wendy. Well, my name is the scary guy, and it is, it is legal. And believe it or not, i got to show you this. It's incredible. Your passport's in the same name. I don't know if you can read it. Can you see it? It's Vaz- a bit difficult. But it is the scary guy. Yeah. And it's on the British passport now, too. So I have a British passport. But what's just funny about that, <laughs> when I became a British citizen, I had, uh, which, by the way, is a whole story unto itself, becoming a British citizen. It's not easy. It's not easy to become a British citizen. It took me 10 years and a lot of money to become a British citizen. Wow. Yeah, and then I applied for my uh, passport, which is what you do when you're a citizen. Yeah. And uh, I sent my uh, data in. I filled out all the required uh, application forms. And they, immigration took two years before they would give me a passport with the name on it, the scary guy. <laughs> two what? years. Two years. Yeah, and illegally they say on their website that it's six to eight, maybe nine weeks max before you have your passport. And if you look it up, the law, it says they legally got to provide you with it, every citizen with a passport if they require, if they up, fill out the application. Well, they had a hard time with my name, but... Uh, Couldn't they spell it? No, I don't know what it was. No, I, I found out that they had a thing called a naming policy. And my name, the scary guy, which isn't a real name, it's a title, but anyway, it didn't fit the naming policy. So they were in meetings for two years to discuss <laughs> how they were going to do this. with, and then break the policy and put my name on a passport. But I don't know what the, the whole, all of the details are, but I, end up, I ended up getting my name on a British passport and um, people have a hard time with it. But it's the scary guy. And uh, it's a long story. I won't bore everybody with the whole details of the, the story, but I changed my name 21 years ago in a court of law because somebody I don't know called me the scary guy in a newspaper advert when I was in town. Well, I had three tattoo shops in Tucson, Arizona, see? And I was a happy, sassy, Harley riding tattoo shop owner, and I had 10 artists working for me, and I made a lot of money, and I thought that's what I would do the rest of my life. And then all of a sudden, one day, in the, a competitor in the business ran a full page out of the newspaper, and he said, are you tired of dealing with scary guys with war paint facial tattoos? And I read the ad in the paper, and I slammed it down on the counter. And the first thought that came to my mind was, what am I going to do to get that guy back? You know, revenge. And uh, I thought, well, I'll run a negative ad about him, and I'll talk. And I didn't even know who he was. And I thought, no, 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 I'm not that kind of guy. I'm a good guy. He's the bad guy. This is what I thought in my mind. See, I went through all these weird yeah. things. And, um, but then I started looking at my life, and I said, you know, I don't know if I'm all that kind of a good guy, really, because I, I'm a name caller, and um, I can hate people, and I talk about hating people, and I just haven't run newspaper ads about it. That's all. So I, I kind of, so in self-reflection, I started seeing myself kind of the same as the guy that ran the ad about me, because I was having mm. a hard time with this guy calling me a name, and I didn't even know who he was. He called me the scary guy, see? So long story short, it it all hit me, and I just realized that that's really kind of who I was the first 43 years of my life. 
I'd lived a scary guy life thinking I was okay and I was a good guy. And so what I did was, in a, in a, it was kind of a joke at first. I talked to one of my friends. I said, you know, I'm going to change my name. I started using a newspaper ad, my, the tattoo shop home of the scary guy. That's what I said. Right. And everybody got to know me and as the scary guy. So I just thought, what the heck? I may as well make it legal. And I went down there and I filed for a name change. And, you know, I didn't even think what would happen. <laughs> no. Well, the judge, the judge says to me, he says, yeah, she calls me up and the courtroom is packed. It's 150 to 200 people in the courtroom is full. And there's newspapers outside. And because somebody's read the news, the filings, you know, they track this stuff. I didn't know that. She says, are you trying to elude or evade any debtors or creditors or anybody like this? And I said, no. She says, well, this is the most unusual name change I've ever granted, but I'm going to go ahead and grant it. She slammed the gavel down, and I became the scary guy on that day, 21 years ago. When I walked out the courtroom, there was three or four news channels in America waiting to interview me about this. What kind of a lunatic would change his name to the scary guy? Well, you're looking at him. This is the lunatic over here. <laughs> And so what I decided to do is I put myself on a seven-day, seven-night challenge. If i really going to change who I am at that point, I decided I wasn't going to be this bad guy anymore and live this lie, basically. I lived this lie for many years, not knowing it. I didn't wake up every day and say, oh, I'm a liar today. No, I just mm -hmm. thought everything I did was okay. I thought, well, is it possible for me to change my ways? And the name represented my past life. That's what people have a hard time with today. They say, what's your name? The scary. They go, you're not scary. No, you're not. <laughs> That's the first thing I said as well. <laughs> I said, well, wait, it's not about my name. It's about my behavior. And they go, oh, oh, yeah. I said, well, then it's also about my past behavior. So I've made some changes since then. So I, in order to make those changes, I put myself on a seven-day, seven-night challenge. And yeah. the rest is history. And they can Google it. They can check it out. And they can read stories and look at film and all kinds of stuff about what I've done. So that's how I got my name. Is it, it, it's kind of weird, actually, when you think about it. And I had a lady in the hospital yesterday. It was an interesting story. I went to the hospital, visited the hospital, and one lady sat me down and was doing a checkup on me. And... She says, you are the most intriguing man, she says. <laughs> you, know, you are so cool. I've got to know more about you, she says. Mm. And she was really positive and really upbeat. And then this is the hospital, you know, the NHS. And I'm going, wow. I looked at her and I said, you're really rare. And she says, what do you mean? I said, not very many people talk to me. And she says, what? I says, no, they act like I'm either not there or that I'm invisible or they look like they ignore me. But I know out of the corner of their eye, they're looking. Because if I saw a guy sitting in a lobby that looked like me, I'd be staring at him. I'm sorry. Because he's that different looking. He's that unusual. Not in a negative way. Just I'd be looking at him. He's tempting. Yeah. From the top of his head all the way down his body, he's got to be full of tattoos. His face is tattooed. So um, anyway, I met this really nice, pleasant lady, and I just thought, well, she reminds me of Wendy. Oh. <laughs> it's true. She, really? she reminded me of you. You have the greatest smile, and you're so pleasant and kind. And I almost feel like, boy, I don't know if I should be on the same show with you. Because oh, like, goodness me. Well, I know when I first met you, I found you so intriguing. Because it was, you gave that, you gave the talk at the TEDx talk. And yeah, your first appearance, it was, wow. You know, you really intrigued. Absolutely. All the tattoos, you had piercings, the long beard. Like, this is a really interesting man. And so I made a point of coming up and talking to you afterwards because I was intrigued and I still am. That is part of it. It was, this man is, he's interesting. 
I want to know more about him. Because, uh, yeah, you have, you've got a lot of stories to tell. But it's, yeah, fascinating. And I really love talking to you because I learn a little bit more about you and what goes on in the world. And, yeah, I hope the listeners find it interesting too. Well, yeah, and I think you just, you brought up an idea and I kind of think the idea is fantastic. And I don't know, maybe we should ask the viewers and the listeners what they think too because. You said, why don't we do a series of these, you and just you and me? I mean, you're going to do your normal podcast anyway, but maybe we do four or five of these in a year or once a quarter or something. And, and we mm. do, and I'm open to that. I think that would be fantastic. And who knows where it might go? You know, maybe we get followers and they want to start asking us questions about certain issues that yeah. they've got. And I'm really up for that. I'm, I'm not doing anything like that right now. So I, this is a really good thing for me to do yeah. because I, I, uh, I miss it. I haven't, uh, since I moved to the UK, which was about eight or nine years ago now, see, um, I, I met a British woman and I married her and her name is Catherine and she's a beautiful person and mm. we live together. And I made the UK my residence because I have very little family in the United States and she has a massive family in the UK. Right. So wouldn't it be fair of me to say we should go live in the U S <laughs> and then, you know, expect her to get along with five brothers and sisters and a mother and uh, 30 nieces and nephews and say, Oh, too bad. They can figure out how to see you on Skype all the time or, or zoom or something mm -hmm. like that. It just wouldn't be right. So I made a sacrifice in my life. And I can tell you, it's not all that easy because my homeland is America. Mm. And this is not my homeland. It is my homeland because I can say I'm a citizen, but I wasn't born and raised here. I don't culturally, I'm still adjusting. Yeah. It's not easy to, to be British. <laughs> No, well, it's not easy for any culture, is it, to make oh. a transition? No. And, uh, well, because, and, uh, we, because we speak the same language, but we don't, because we have different words and different ways of being. But people say because we can basically understand each other because we all speak English, then we should be the same, but we're not. No. And there are, I should imagine you struggled with all the laws and the cultural change, everything it would be very different. Oh, it's massively different. And I yeah. tell you, Catherine said something to me yesterday because I went and had that hospital visit and met that beautiful hospital lady. And she wrote me a note to remind me to be gentle and kind. And I went, what do you mean? Aren't I gentle and kind? She says, well, yes, I know you and I love you and I married you and I understand you culturally. And I says, well, just tell me exactly what you mean. She says, everybody else sees you as abrasive, rude, obnoxious, in their face because of the way you are. You, you're straightforward. You talk. You, you, you ask questions. British people don't like to talk about things that much directly. You know, everything's mm. indirect and you're supposed to guess and figure it out. And there's not that much direct communication. And in America, everybody goes, what do you mean? And then they go, you, and you tell them, and they go, okay, thanks. And they get on with their life. Yeah. yeah. You know? And I go, okay, yeah. And so I reminded myself when I went to the hospital, I, I said, okay, wait a minute. I got to take it slow, and I got to act a little like, and I got to say, yes, thank you. And, oh, that's nice. Thank you very much. And I got along just fine. And she's right. Because if yeah. I would have opened my mouth and did the normal scary guy American routine, I probably would have alienated somebody and they would have been upset with me. In fact, I know that's true. How do I know that's true? You're supposed to ask me. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, how do you know that's true? <laughs> because I was in another hospital in Wigan and they have on the file that I was, they put on the file, on my file, that I'm uh, aggressive. Really? I'm aggressive on my file in Wigan at the Wigan Hospital. 
That's how they perceive me. And I go, well, I've already got a label at the hospital in Wigan. I don't want a second one in a different hospital. So I was kind and nice. To you. But I wasn't aggressive. I, didn't, I don't see myself. Do you see me as aggressive? No, I've, none, I've not seen that in you at all. Oh, well, that, a lot of people take this energy. But is, that, but is that because they see you and they see your tattoos and they've made a decision about you without really knowing you. And is that because you are direct? And people, as you say, especially the British, they can't cope with being direct. I don't like confrontation. No, you don't like, what you don't like is you don't like conflict because you assume that if you are direct and say what you want, that it will turn into conflict. Yep, absolutely. I think this is what the problem is. People judge. And I don't know about you, but when I have clients and maybe I'll get, if they're referred to me, I may get some background about them. And it's a case of, ah, well, I, if I see, if somebody just walks in the door or I've had a conversation with them, I have no preconceived ideas at all. But if I get notes <laughs> and there is, oh, heck, that person sounds like they could be really difficult to deal with or that person, they might be tricky or they might be, you start off with that. Or if I have a conversation, I had a conversation with a client. I hadn't, we hadn't met. She called me and said, oh, I really can't make this call. I can't make it. I'm really upset and we got to change it. And she really sounded quite feisty on the phone and I thought oh my goodness I don't know if I can help this lady I don't know how I feel about her and we she came and she was culturally different yeah. and then I went ah now I get it yeah you could sense all the anger inside her but you know what I know inside that tough outer shell as we work more and more together there is a beautiful person in there. And that's what I think whenever I meet someone, that yes, we can be, have preconceived ideas, but we need to see what's beyond that. That's right. That happens to me a lot in my business and of doing what I do to help people, you know, and I'm sure like you just said, it happens to you all the time. But when I'm in a school, for instance, mm. uh, they'll, they'll ask me, they'll say, hey, scary. We've got this kid, and he really needs some help. Do you think you could, could you do a one-to-one -one session with him in the school? And I said, well, yeah, but their parents have to be there, number one. And you've got to have a support person from the school there so that they can work with them when we're all done. And it's usually a 90-minute session. And so anyway, and these are kids that are from 12 years on up, older. Mm -hmm. And so the principal will sit me down in the chair in her office, and she'll say, Okay, let me give you all the data and all the information I got on this kid before you meet with him. Would you like all this information? And I look at her and go, no. And she sits there completely dumbfounded, like, you don't want my help. First of all, she takes that personally. Like, I was, mm. you know, told her that it's not important. For me, you're not important. No, no, it's not about what you got. I said, if I get the information in my head about all the things you've discovered, I said, then I generate preconceived notions in my mind about this person and say, so what I need to do is not know anything about this person and treat it like self-discovery. I want to yeah. discover who this person is so that I can be open to helping them without all of the, because I'm a judgmental person and I was born and raised to learn how to judge people based on what I see and hear from them. So. And then I'm not that way so much now, but sometimes I can slip into that. But the truth is, is if I don't have, if I have a clean slate and I'm not in that mode of creating all kinds of things about what they've heard, it's all hearsay information anyway, then I can meet with this person and discover who they are. And they seem more free to talk mm. and share who they are with me. Because it feels genuine. It feels real. Yeah. It's not contrived. It's not made up. Mm. And, 
So I just tell them all no now, and I don't want to know any information about anybody before I sit down to talk to them. And I think that's a great policy in life, really. If you can have a clean slate every time you meet someone. And I've gone so far to say this out loud, too. I says, I don't care if they've been in prison. I don't care if they're a prisoner. I don't care if they've been abusive in their past. I don't care what their past history is. This is a brand new day and a brand new moment. And um, everybody can make some changes in their lives. And, and if you don't give them that opportunity to make those changes, they're never going to see it. They're never going to be able to do it. Yeah. Just stuck in that same old judgmented shell and box that they've been put in. And that's what they think they are. So anyway, yeah. that's, that's kind of... Yeah, I'm in total agreement with you. And I, I do have this mantra that I use, which is don't judge someone till you walk to mine in their shoes. Ouch. I get it all the time. Yeah. Wigan, Wigan, I live in Wigan now, believe it or not. People can't believe I live in Wigan. Mm-hmm. And uh, halfway between uh, Manchester and Liverpool. And uh, <laughs> people look at me and they go, what are you doing in Wigan, man? And the people that live in Wigan ask me, what are you doing in Wigan? Like it's a horrible place. And I even had one old older lady, I say older because I'm older now, you know, but I guess I can say older because I am older. I'm guessing she's in her 70s and she went to the building I was at and it said aged UK in the top of the building. And I thought, well, this is where old people go. It's a charity to get help. So anyway, she saw me near the Age UK building and she walked over and she heard my accent, American accent. And she said, in her Wigan way, she said, so what are you doing here? I go, I says, I live here now. And she says, you what? And I says, I live here. And I said, live right here in this building. And she says, why would you want to live here? She says, and I says, well, what do you mean? Why? What's wrong with it? She says, Wigan is an asshole. It's absolutely horrible. Now, this is a lady that's born and raised and lived in Wigan her whole life. And this is what she thinks of her town. And I'm thinking, okay, well, then I say, well, should I go to Manchester? And then they go, oh, no. Don't go to Manchester. It's horrible. It's a terrible place. (laughs) Wait a minute. Should I go to Liverpool then? And they go, oh, no, never go to Liverpool. It's terrible in Liverpool. (laughs) I'm thinking, everywhere I talk to these people, everywhere I go, it's another horrible place. And I'm going, I guess it's not going to make any difference then, is it, whether I stay in Wigan or not? No, oh, really. It's what you make of it, isn't it? We can all call everything bad, but if there are, if, you know, I, I live, yeah, I live in a similar place because people say, where do you live? Oh, and I say, oh, oh my God. But what they don't, you know, and it's not a bad place at all, but what they don't see around them is we've got such beautiful countryside around us. I'm well, fine. It's actually a beautiful a, place. It's a beautiful yeah. place. And the people yeah, are just, and, this and, is and, it, but know, people, yeah, I don't know what people want from it, really. There's good and bad everywhere. Um, well, but then I started figuring it out culturally. Yeah. And, uh, and here I am, I might be generalizing and stereotyping because I'm going to say this. I'm going to say the British culture likes to hear about the downfall of the next guy. Something that happened to them that caused them a grief and a problem. So everybody can commiserate and create all kinds of negative stuff around it. And they can then talk about all the negative. And I'm going, now, they do some of that in America, but there seems to be a lot of the other, too. There seems to be a lot of people that are wanting to talk about more of the positive stuff. Yeah, It's 50-50. But here in Britain, it feels like it's... 70 30 you know or it, it, people mm. are more apt to look at your newspapers uh-huh. look at your, i don't even uh-huh. know if you call them newspapers i mean gossip magazines you know it's like mm. it's one negative story after another i don't even look at them i don't even look at the news anymore it's just that way no i don't either 
I don't watch the news um, simply because. Well, how do you cope? Oh, wonderfully! <laughs> I have the most wonderful time because I couldn't give a damn what's going on. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. Oh, when I see or hear there are six pieces of bad news, one after another, sensationalized. What does it do? It just creates fear within us. And if you start your day feeling fearful, I can't walk out the door. I might get mugged. I can't go up to London. There could be a terrorist. I can't. I mean, for goodness sake. Oh, coronavirus. Hell, yeah. it's, you know, That's we live terrible. our whole lives in fear. But what is interesting, I mean, yeah, they would do it to sell the news, sell newspapers. But I have this theory it controls the masses as well. Yes, I agree 100%. Because if all the time we're fearful, we're going to be behave. They, they, we're not going to step out of line too far. That's it. So and I think I, that's something to do with how people perceive me because I ask more questions. Probably over 60% of my life is asking mm. people questions. And only because... It's the only way I'm going to know more. It's the only way I'm going to find out. But they think it's, I don't know, they just take it real personal. Like you're intrusive and you're abrupt and you're, what do you want to know for? And they get really defensive and, and then they, you know, it's like, wow. And I'm going, hey, come on, man. I'm a pretty nice guy. I ask people about uh, their kids on the pathways and the sidewalks. You know, I see little kids and they're, mm -hmm. and they're having fun. Kids are really cool. And they're innocent, and, and I walk up and I say, "Hey, look at that! Look at that outfit he's wearing or she's wearing." And it's a little three or four year old, and they're having fun doing their thing on the sidewalk on the pathway. And the parents turn around, look at me like I'm maybe I'm a pedophile or something, or I'm a stranger danger. You know, it's like, why are you talking to me? And I'm thinking. Because I think that I, your kid's cool and I'm saying something positive, you know, in my mind, I'm going, but they get, some of them don't like talking about it. And, and of so course there is that whole fear around pedophiles, stranger danger. And yeah. so people, they're seeing that any of us that are just genuinely just being friendly, you shouldn't talk to them. What, what do you want? What's the problem? What are you going to do? Why are you carrying a gun? You know, I mean, oh, for goodness sake. Ma? Yeah, well, maybe that's how they cope with things. We were talking a little bit about coping, I guess, but maybe that's how they cope. They, they, yes. they, they learn mechanisms of coping with things is to close down and not interact. It's kind of a dangerous thing to do nowadays, I guess. Yeah. That's what they think. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've been talking now for about half an hour, and I, I just... I think we had a plan of what we were going to talk about, but I think we're going to leave that to another day. And we're going to keep the audience kind of on their toes and just wonder what we might talk about next time because I think, um, yeah, that could be... Yeah, let's keep them a cliffhanger. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Let's figure out in the comments section, of because I'll post this and you're going to post it, and we'll cross-post it, and we'll put it all over social media. And in the comments section, we want you to tell us what you want to hear about. Yeah. And we are going to open up and, and share some really cool ideas and concepts, like coping was one of them we were going to talk about today. Yeah. We really got there, but next time we'll get to this. But if you've got your ideas, I think that would be really terrific to hear from you. Yeah, I think you too. And I, I love doing this. And I love talking to you. It's always intriguing. <laughs> And I learn more and more about you. And I learn a lot about you too. You're fantastic. So how do people get in touch with you? If they want to learn more about what you do, because you do help people. Well, you... they, can call, they can call my mobile phone. That's a, okay. they, they can. I put my mobile phone on Facebook. I put my mobile phone number on Twitter. I put my mobile phone number on everything. And yeah. everybody goes, what are you doing? I says, I'm in the people business. Look at me. I love people. I mm -hmm. says, you can't be in the people business and close off. And they said, yeah, but it's your private information. I said, I don't care. Look at me. I'm not private anymore. This is my life. Mm -hmm. I says, so I put it on, and you can call me on the phone. You can email me. You can 
message me on Facebook. You can comment on YouTube. On the, it will be on our YouTube channel. Go to my website. It's thescaryguy.com. It's 07496-605-866. Scaryguy at thescaryguy.com. And all of that will be put in the... What is the it? show notes. Yeah. All yeah. in the show notes. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm an open book. Anytime, anywhere, anything. If you're negative with me and you want to be um, abusive and all that stuff, I'll give you a chance. I'll talk to you. But if you continue with that behavior, chances are there's a thing called ban and block. I'm going to ban and block you because I'm not going to sit and take it. You know, it's no. just not healthy for me. So no, all of that is possible. And, and, we, and I deal with all of it and I hear it and see it. So any way, shape or form, let's go. Brilliant. Thank you so much for today. I've so enjoyed it. I hope the listeners have to. It's just uh, always a pleasure chatting to you. Well, you rock. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to know more about me, go to my website, wendycatewell.co.uk, where you can find out about my services and how to contact me. Until next time, bye.